Step one, start the webinar. Okay. Tell me when. Good, good. Good, Doctor. You can go ahead. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by SADA to this evening. I am Dr. Hira, and I will be your host for this evening. Thank you to our, one of our sponsors, Henry Shine, together with Eltion. Our webinar this evening will cover a topic which will be presented by Professor Dr. Dr. Angelo Trudhan. A few announcements before we proceed. Please refrain from using the raise hand function, but rather type your comments and questions in the Q&A tips so that we may address them. With regards to CPD certificates, they will be loaded on the SADA platform and you will be able to access the certificates under your member profile. If, however, you are a non-member, you will still have access to these. You will be required to create a profile for yourself and will then be able to access these certificates. The event tonight qualifies for one CEU point. We will be streaming live on YouTube also. So in case you get have difficulty connecting via Zoom, please use those platforms as well. A reminder to all participants, there will be a question here and a survey which will be broadcast at the end of this webinar. Once the session has been ended, the uh, survey will pop up. If everyone could please answer this, uh, the survey. Once again, thank you to our sponsors, Henry Shine and Altion. Um, at this point, I'd like to hand over to one of my co-hosts, and co-presenters from Henry Shine, Mr. Marius de Brain. Mr. Marius de Brain, over to you. I'll say, good, good, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining this evening. Um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm Marius de Brain. I'm the National Sales and Technical Manager for Henry Shine, South Africa. Um, first of all, I want to thank Action for co-hosts co and sponsoring this evening for us. Uh, it's a real privilege, and I think you guys will find it intuitive, um, the lecture tonight. Before we kick off, I would like to give you a quick introduction to our company. Most of you might uh, already know us as, the, as Dental Warehouse. In February of this year, we had our name change, and we are Henry Shine Dental Warehouse from February. This is not just a name change. Um, this is more than a name change. And I we're able to provide you with the best solutions now, with better products. And also, what's very exciting, our equipment range, what's expanding month by month. We all know the industry is evolving, and digital industry is also evolving. And day by day, we're getting more and more queries on, on those topics. First of all, um, I will just like to tell you about some of our new um, equipment range that we are having in our available from us is we have a full digital um, range now we have internal scanning and everything in between and as you all know us and you have learned to trust us on our consumable business you're more than welcome to give us a chance on our equipment business and we just want to say thank you for all the customers already supporting us and we are looking forward to supporting the others as well. And uh, now our Julian will assist us with some product information as well. From Action, thank you. So thank, thank you, Marius. So just let me uh, introduce myself. So good evening first, uh, everybody. Nice to be uh, with you uh, from France. So I'm Julian Pelletier. I'm the sales director for Action, Action Group. Uh, I would like first to thank you, Sada, to thank Sada for the invitation and thanks as well, Henri Shine, for, uh, for the local partnership we have as a distributor of a brand in South Africa. So just to let you understand who we are, uh, Action is an exist a company existing since more than uh, 40 years now, I would say like 50 years. Uh, we are a bit more well known in South Africa under the name of uh, Satellec, as we manufacture a big range of products. We have equipment range, imaging range, and pharma range in the uh, equipment range. We have all the uh, ultrasound generator that you find in your chair, and as well the piezo, piezo surgery system that uh, Angelo will introduce 
a little bit probably because you will see some cases with the piezo surgeries application. And uh, we have as, uh, as well, uh, Marius told us, uh, imaging range really wide with uh, some product like this one you see um, on the back, which is a, a prime system, a 3D, 2D uh, system existing as well in a CEF system, really uh, small and really easy to install and to use. So um, I will be happy that you contact Myers to get more information about this product that is newly uh, on the market now in South Africa. And we, we were performing some installation with the Happy customer. And uh, as uh, Marius told as well, we have a wide range of radio and throughout system with sensor, scanner, camera, um, all uh, available in South Africa through uh, Henri Shine. And uh, I would be really happy that Marius contact you or did contact Marius to get more information about this product. So um, after this brief uh, introduction about Acteon, um, I will let uh, Dr. Priviesh introduce um, Professor Angelo Troedan, uh, who do a presentation uh, of uh, CBCT. So thank you and enjoy this presentation. Thank you, Julian. A reminder to our delegates once again, please do not use the question and answer tab or the chat function to raise any questions and concerns. Please use, um, instead of using the chat function, use the Q&A functions so that we can address those questions. Our topic tonight is indications and in the execution of digital Im imaging as well as a presentation of a few cases. As I mentioned earlier, our, present our presenter is Professor Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Angelo Trudhan. A little bit about Professor. Professor Dr. Dr. Angelo Trudhan is a specialist in craniofacial, craniomaxillofacial surgery with focus on traumatology, reconstruction, and cosmetic surgery of the face with a double uh, uh, appropriation, also specialist in dentistry and periodontology. His scientific focus in the, in the, uh, in the past was laser research. Since 2005, he developed patented piezoelectric surgical tools and minimally invasive surgical procedures and published numerous experimental results in randomized clinical studies regarding ultrasonic surgical devices and surgical protocols, as well as implant systems in the international peer review journals. He currently chairs the International Academy of Ultrasonic Surgery and Implantology. His most recent scientific work focuses on development of artificial intelligence based on user-friendly software tools for CBCT-based diagnosis and minimally invasive treatment planning. He is also a permanent member of the International Biomaterial Experts Group in Switzerland and co-editor of several peer-reviewed journals. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Professor Dr. Dr. Angelo Trudhan. Professor, uh, over to you. So, hello and a warm welcome from Austria to South Africa. I'm very, very sorry that I'm not there physically to speak to you in person, but um, I heard that you managed the COVID pandemic quite well until now. Um, we are already in the second lockdown, so uh, we have enough time to do a lot of webinars from our home office. So today's topic will be the digital imaging. It's the focus on digital imaging, but of course, digital imaging by itself, it's just the tool to improve our workflow and the predictab predictability of our workflow. So just to give you a short idea on why we need the uh, especially radiological digital workflow, because by radiology, we can reveal the unseen. So fortunately, um, it reveals the truth, as you can see here. A lot of years ago, we did this almost only uh, based on 2D imaging. So the basic digital workflow was based on intra X-rays and on uh, panoramic X-rays, just to give you an overview, but it was only a two-dimensional depiction 
of a three-dimensional situation. And the reason why I, as a specialist in cranial maxillofacial surgery with a focus on traumatology and reconstructive surgery, um, I have my special job in the traumatology department because my colleagues from the general traumatology, they deal with the entire body, starting with the brain going down to the limbs, um, to the center of the body, but the head itself is so complicated and radiographically also so complicated that they need a specialist to deal only with the facial region of the skull. So how do we proceed in dentistry basically? Because on one hand, we have to be, to be as precise as possible. On the other hand, we have to be quick. So the obligatory indications in dentistry at the first reception and the annual recall also, approximal carious detection, endodontics, periodontics, oral surgery stay two-dimensional because this is very easy to handle. It doesn't take much time. And of course, it doesn't take much cost. But at the reception of the new patients and of course, at any recall in Austria, we do this every second year because it's a regulatory issue. We have to do at least once a year or every second year a panoramic x-ray that has to be made as a first overview to determine possible hidden pathology processes uh, the patient might not be aware of. Here you can see one, one of these cases because as you can see here, there is a hint to a pathological structure, but we still don't know, is it just a polyp in the sinus cavity or is it a big cyst or whatsoever? It just gives an overview so if we are in doubt, there could be something and the patient reports sometimes pains, then of course we have to proceed to the third dimension. And as you can see here in the two dimensional panoramic x-rays, the pathology was hinted, but now finally we can see the full extent of the pathology. So it was not a polyp in the sinus, it was a big, big cyst that was already occluding the sinus at the antrum base. And of course, it was filled with mucus. And this is very important to know before you step into surgery, because you have to make uh, decisions before you do the surgery, instead of just stepping in and then wondering where you could be. Because if you just do an episectomy in this case, and you open this, you might think this could be the sinus, but instead, it's, it's the cyst cavity and you have to do the decision if you open the cyst cavity to the sinus or if you fill this with bone graft material to enable later on, it's some kind of, of bone augmentation to enable labor later on the um, insertion of implants. As you can see here now, you see the full extent of the cyst. It doesn't only cover the premolar, it also covers the molar and you can get a very, very good idea and you can get a very good view on the full extension of the pathology. To give you another example, because uh, we always and we very often, especially in the mandible, but also in the, in the maxilla, we deal with critical soft tissue structures. So this is another example. This is a molar and the molar obviously has a cyst, but now we need to know if the cyst interferes with the mandibular nerve or if there is a bony separation between the apex of the roots, the cyst cavity and the mandibular nerve. And for this, we need to present this to ourselves and also to the patient and for a proper uh, surgical planning. We need to see this pathology in the third dimension. So here you can see some uh, different uh, views on the situation in different bone filters so that you can get a much better uh, idea how the clinical situation will be. And in this case, of course, we have to depict the mandibular nerve, which can be drawn by, sim uh, by very simple to use tools inside the, uh, the software that is provided with the x Trium CPCT so that you can do a proper planning and that you don't get, um, let's say, uh, caught in the act if you're in the middle of the surgery and suddenly you might not know where you are and what you do. 
So this is why we speak about the so-called digital workflow, because in some 50 years or let's say even some 30 years ago, radiography was still based on photography. You had to develop the, the uh, X-film X-ray, but now everything is done digital. So this means you can do it chair side. So when we speak about um, pure dental diagnostics, then of course we need uh, to detect carriers to give us an overview of the state of the patient on one hand and on the other hand uh, to the treatment needs, to what extent you will have to do the preparation. This we can do with an intraoral camera that is also digitally um, acquired digital imaging with special substances, you can reveal uh, carriers much better so that you perfectly know before you start the preparation to which extent you will have to do the preparation. And what is even more important, especially uh, for the legal situ uh, situation of documentation, you can store these pictures on your uh, hard disk and even after 20 or 30 years, if you didn't have a crash of your computer or of your server, then of course you can still look back and have a clear view on what the diagnosis was. Because um, when you treat the patient for a long time, when you serve your patients for a long time, sometimes or the longer you work, the more the questions will arise. Oh, but was this necessary back some 20 years ago? Or when did you do this filling? And then you can just um, go to your server, you open the file of the patient, you go back, you see the image, and you can prove the patient what the need was at that time. So digital workflow and carries therapy, of course, is intraoral camera. And of course, it's also digital imaging with the intraoral camera. You can have a view um, on approximate sites, which are almost impossible to achieve with your own eye, with your unaided eye, or also with a mirror, because you can do a preparation, but if you want to know if the carriers was totally removed and if the adjacent tooth has also some kind of infection with carriers, then of course you can take the intraoral camera and check the approximate space. And this you can then do a second check, you do the primary preparation, then you use this, um, this uh, lighting substance on the tooth again, and you can again detect if some carriers was left. If you remove then this layer, you find out, okay, now the tooth is carriers free and you can proceed with the proper filling therapy. This is very important because uh, you have to make visible hidden issues. This is why um, some 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was very difficult. The patient suffered from a lot of secondary carriers because it, because it was almost impossible to visualize if you removed all the carriers and if the filling was made in a proper way. <clears throat> now, what would be the outfit of your clinic? You can see here, my surgery room, but what I want to point your um, focus on is that I have the intra or x-ray directly in my, um, in my ORs. This is my surgical OR for cosmetic surgery, reconstructive surgery, bone augmentation, etc., etc. It's, um, it's uh, attached to a swing arm, so I can use it in this room, but also in the other room. You see, you can spare some money if you do an intelligent planning. And as you can see here, it's very easy to do because if you do an uh, endodontic treatment, um, of course you could use an apex finder, but it's always nice to see we, we are hand workers and we live on visual impressions. And if you perfectly want to know if you are doing the right thing, if you already uh, did the uh, endodontic treatment down to the apex, in this case uh, with the lower mandibular, you can check at every single step of your work directly. So you ask the patient to place the intraoral <clears throat> um, x-ray scanner into the mouth. You do the x-ray and within two or three seconds, you've got the image on the screen and you can proceed. You can decide, okay, here I have to 
do the preparation a little bit more down. Uh, maybe I will have to seek for a different way to fill the root canals because you visualize your therapeutic needs at every single step and you can uh, have a perfect control over your work. So this is another example, the benefits of the chair set availability. You have a safe workflow without any interruption and maximum precision of treatment. So this is how the work should be done and how the work should be documented. Not to leave it to chances, like it was some ages before that you did the endodontic treatment and you sent the patient to do this morphine x-ray in a separate room. Now you can do this directly chair side with almost no radiation. And this makes your life much, much more relaxed because you don't lose time by waiting. And this is why our time is, is very, very valuable. But at a certain point, of course, you have to extend your view on the third dimension, how to make the hidden visible before you start the therapy. And this is very, very important. So where do we need this? Because the anatomy of the human, of the facial skull, especially maxilla and mandibula, by overprojection in 2D uh, panoramic X-rays and intraoral X-rays, it is very, very complex. We have the superimposition of different layers of bone, of different tissues. Of course, we also have some, um, some um, let's say, hidden spots if the patient already has some metallic or zirconia oxide uh, prosthetic treatment that hides certain parts of the bone in 2D. This now you can make visible in 3D. Just to give you a nice overview, this is, of course, a carriers-free and, um, and an almost perfect upper jaw and lower jaw. But what is so important with the modern digital workflow is that you don't only receive um, X-ray-like images, but with special color filters that reflect or that are correlated to the densities. For instance, in this case, the reddish color is correlated with the density of the dentine. The whitish color is correlated with the, uh, with the crystallite density of the animal. And of course, the bone has different bone densities. You can see up here, it's more whitish because the bone is not so dense. And down here, it's more similar, especially the cortical parts, more similar to the dentine because the cortical bone is harder. And you can take a look at every single side. You can do a horizontal cut, then you can see the configuration of the uh, root canals and they don't stick to the anatomy as we learned it in our anatomy textbooks. <clears throat> you can do a transversal cut to see the extent of the pulp and irregularities in the formation of the pulp. And of course, you can do a lateral view, which is almost similar to the panoramic X-ray. So in a, in a lot of cases, we need to visualize what cannot be seen in panoramic X-ray. Just to give you another example, this is a young boy and he has a supernumerarius tooth here, a so-called mesiodens. And of course, some of the permanent teeth that are developing are stopped by this mesiodens, but you have to visualize because before you start to remove this mesiodens, of course, you perfectly have to know how to access and from which side to access, not to uh, hurt any of the vital structures of the surrounding teeth that you want to, um, to reveal. Uh, in the course of time, because surgery should be done in a way that you don't harm the surrounding tissues. This can be done very perfectly with, uh, with piezotomes, but still you have to know what is the perfect approach to remove these mesiotens. <clears throat> then, of course, when we speak about impacted third molars, of course, most of the impacted third molars are, let's say, without symptoms, but uh, even if they are without symptoms and the patient doesn't feel anything or doesn't feel pain, 
sometimes it happens that you have a coronary cyst that with the time starts to extend. And sometimes it's very difficult to see this even in a panoramic x-ray. So uh, if you have the doubt there could be something, if you see some shadows in the panoramic x-ray, then of course the next step will always be to do a, um, a CBCT scan and you might then find out that you have a big coronary cyst like this. Prof, sorry to stop you there. Can I intervene for a second? Yes, please. We seem to have a problem in terms of the clarity of your slides. Is it possible for you to, to stop, uh, to close your presentation and start sharing it again to see if we can improve the quality so that our delegates are able yes. to see it in better quality? Okay, oh. I will try. So we have been here. So our delegates, apologies for this technical glitch. We're trying to improve the quality. If you could give us a few minutes. Okay. So I will do this one. Now, how is the situation now? Is it better now? Prof, that's much better on my side. I'm okay. just going to ask if any of the delegates who are watching, if anyone can confirm that for us, if they are now happy with the quality of the slides. From it's my clear, side, it's very good. I think we can go. Okay. okay. So, Prof, you can continue. Perfect. So now this is another case where, of course, the patient reported some problems with his impacted third molar. And as you can see already, just imagine this would be a panoramic x-ray. You see an overprojection of the apex of the um, impacted third molar with a mandibular nerve. Now, of course, you will have to know where the nerve exactly is. Is it on the buccal side? Is it on the lingual side? And this can be depicted only in the third dimension. So in this case, you see it's right attached, the mandibular nerve is right attached uh, to the apex of the root on the lingual side. And this is then how you have to plan your surgery to remove the tooth without hurting the mandibular nerve. And this is where you can't do without um, CBCT technology anymore. So why is it like that? Because we know the panoramic X-ray diagnosis only shows a two-dimensional overlay picture. This is some kind of stay-at-home message because we all stay at home um, in a complex three-dimensional anatomy. The CBCT diagnosis reveals pathologies unseen in panoramic X-rays, especially when it comes to the diagnosis of the anatomic position of nerves, vessels, and membranes. And of course, CBCT allows bone quality determination, precise surgical planning and digital workflow from planning up to prosthetic treatment. So this is just uh, a short overview of the technology, two dimensions and three dimensions. Uh, when I planned my clinic, of course, I had the two dimensional plan, but of course, it's much better to see how the structure will be, how the workflow will be when I see my future clinic in the third dimension before I even start to build it. This is very important. It's very important also in endodontics because you can see here you have an apical uh, granuloma, but you want to know why is this. So you do a CBCT scan and you see an additional canal, which is very uncommon for a lower premolar. And then you have the answer. So you can decide now, do you do an episectomy? Do you extract the tooth? Or do you do a revision of your endodontic treatment? Next step, sometimes cases look simple in panoramic x-rays because um, as you can see here, we have a periodontal, um, we have a periodontal situation that needs a removal of this bridge here, of the teeth here. But when we take a look in the third dimension, we see that the entire situation is much worse than expected in the panoramic X-ray. We see a complete periodontal deprivement of this upper molar. We see here also resorptions, but what is even more important, we see the soft tissue of the sinus cavity because of course here we have the question if we uh, can perform a sinus lift procedure. So if we go to the periodontal analysis, it's also very important to see and to, um, to visualize the periodontal situation in all three dimensions. 
just to give you an idea, because if you see uh, periodontal resorptions in a panoramic x-ray, of course, you want to know if the forcations are already trapped into the periodontitis um, uh, situation or not. And for this, of course, you need a, CB, a 3D CBCD depiction. And as you can see here now, you can move this forward, backward. You can take a look at all the signs. You can inspect the forcation. And even before you start your therapy, you will know what you can do. I just want to point your uh, focus now on the forcation defect here in the backside of the molar. Uh, this, of course, is going to be very difficult uh, to manage with uh, conservative treatment. So uh, with the help of a three-dimensional depiction where you can see the anatomical situation and the periodontal situation from all the sides, especially from the inside, you cannot crawl in your patient and take a look from the inside. But you see here, if you inspect this, this is already periodontitis in the forcation. So either you know that you might have to extract the tooth or you may, may choose to do a surgical approach instead of only a conservative periodontal treatment approach. And this you can only do and satisfactorily do with um, the least risk of failure of the therapy if you know the situation before you start the treatment. So once again, full visualization of periodontal defects, also very important if you plan extraction therapy and implant insertion. And then of course we get to the routine diagnosis because the routine diagnosis is what we have to do every day on our patient because they come, maybe they have no problems, but they want to know what could be wrong with them. And so once again, if uh, you already know from the history of the patient that there are some, uh, let's say, pathologies known, in this case, they impact the third molar. Of course, you want to know how the impacted third molar is localized, and maybe the patient has got problems with this impacted third molar. You will perfectly know how to proceed with the surgical therapy because you know before you start the treatment that the apex of the roots is going to be right in between the uh, furcation of the roots of the second molar in the upper jaw. If you don't know this before, maybe the whole surgery is going to be a disaster. Another um, issue, uh, of course, from the panoramic x-ray, you will always know that this tooth has to be extracted. But if you do a 3D, a CBCT, and you turn around the picture to all sides, you see that we already have an open antral fistula caused by the periodontal disease. And you perfectly know what you have to expect and what you have to do uh, to perform the correct treatment. This video is unfortunately a little bit distorted, so I will stop this and we can proceed. Also, we can do a, a diagnosis of TMJ disorders. Until now, you always had to send the patient to the uh, CAT scan or even to a, a nuclear resonance tomography. But now with this high technology, with this high resolution of the x mind Triome um, CBCD scans, you can perfectly depict the TMJ in all aspects. You can take a look uh, at the TMJ from all sides. You can do the measurements. And what is even more important, as you can see here, faintly, this is what you cannot see in the CBC, uh, in the CAT scan. But now in the CBCT, you can see similar, like in the um, magnetic resonance tomography, an outline of the disc. And this is then one of the most important parts in TMG diagnosis and, of course, in correct treatment planning. So when we get to the, um, to the planning of implants and guided surgery, uh, nowadays, some 10, 15 years ago, I was still stating that a good surgeon should always be able to do a good implant surgery and guided bone surgery without three-dimensional uh, planning before, but nowadays this has changed completely because as you can see in this case, 
um, especially in the empty jaw, in the edentulous upper and lower jaw, sometimes it's quite difficult to navigate. And of course, all our therapies should be precisely driven by the result, which is the prosthetic result and not like in, in Germany, it happens from time to time that the work, the entire work is split up between different um, uh, specialties and subspecialties like the oral surgeon, the cranial maxillofacial surgeon does the bone augmentation, the oral surgeon then inserts the implants, not knowing what the prosthetic outcome should be. And this is one of the most important aspects that you do a reverse engineering. That means you have to know before you start the therapy, how the prosthetic treatment should look like. And then according to the prosthetic treatment, you can start to insert your virtual implants in the 3D planning software. It's the AIS 3D app in the correct places to achieve the best possible result. And this is the most important part in the most advanced CBCD technology you will be able to see the bone density. For the first time in history of 3D workflow and 3D diagnosis, you will be able to check the individual patient's bone quality, the biomechanical bone quality. So just to give you a hint, whatever looks very, very uh, green is more dense bone. What is red is, it below, uh, is below a certain Huntsville value and this gives you an idea about poor bone quality, because especially in these cases, it's always the question, can I do immediate loading or not? Because the patients by Dr. Google always get the information, new teeth in one hour. You can do everything. You can place two implants and then do a 12 piece bridge on top of two implants, all on two, all on four, all on six or whatsoever. Of course, in some cases, this will be possible. In most of the cases, it won't be possible because of the bone quality. Just imagine if you just place here only two or four implants and the bone over the implants has to take the load, a very, very high load, which is about 300 uh, kilograms per square, square centimeters. Of course, the bone is the weakest part in the entire story. So of course, only by the bone density measurements, you will be able to decide how many implants the patient will need for a sustainable long-term success of your implant therapy. Then of course, you can construct the surgical kites based on the CBCT, again, with bone density measurement, in this case, in the mandible. And you can export the prosthesis already, which you constructed in the AIS 3D app software, you can export this and send it to a printer to do an immediate uh, restoration, also for the mandible. And then you can place this onto the uh, CBCT image, check for the consistency, check for the cosmetics, adjust the cosmetics, adjust teeth things, et cetera, et cetera, for a perfect planning. You can adjust the bite height, whatever you want before you start your therapy on the patient, you already know what the perfect outcome will be. And this is the very, very nice part because you don't have to take chances anymore. Before you start the work, you already know the outcome. This is then the final result. Of course, the checkup x-rays you can do in 2D because it's just to give you the, um, um, a view on the implants that were inserted. This is then the three-dimensional representation. The implants are, of course, perfectly placed exactly at the spots where they should be placed and also where the bone quality is the best. And this is another example. This is a situation after the extraction of two molars, which were periodontally compromised. Of course, you see a big defect here. And now the question is, do I wait? until I can insert the implants maybe for half a year because such big defects, they need more time than three months to heal. But since the outer, uh, the, the lingual and the buccal bone plate are highly compact and they are not compromised or they were not compromised by the periodontal disease, 
now you can choose an implant with a wider diameter so that the implant gains its primary stability in the compact bone. And as you can see here, you see everything is green. This is light green. This is a little, little bit less green, but in this case, no immediate loading, of course, but it's not a problem to do a delayed implant insertion, a short delayed implant insertion, maybe some six or eight weeks after the extraction of the teeth, instead of waiting for half year or nine months until you then into a shrunken bone, into a resorbed bone um, as a compromise, some uh, low diameter implants. So precise bone densitometry, this is another issue. We published this um, already back in 2019 because we wanted to investigate if the bone density and the prediction of the implant stability is also applicable to situations where you did an augmentation with bone graft materials. Because until now, all the publications you might have read, uh, they just deal with native bone. But we wanted to know how is the biomechanical stability in case we insert implants into augmented bone. In this case, with the sinus lift, we did this with the intralift technology. My research team developed. It's a transcrestal approach, minimal invasive. Um, and highly effective. Here you can see a clinical case, and this is how it looks if you, when you fill the uh, sinus cavity with the intralift through a single transcrestal approach of only 2.8 millimeters width. So that means by hydrodynamic forces, by the piezotome cavitation effect, you're able to detach the sinus membrane from the entire sinus floor, and then immediately fill the cavity, uh, the subantral uh, scaffold with bone graft material. This we did with different bone graft materials, and then we checked the insertion torque value, the primary stability of the implants with these different bone materials. Here you can see the calibrated Hounsfield values with a very dense bone graft material. You can see all light green. This is the best sign that you can do immediate loading in this case. When you compare this, for instance, to the same molar, uh, let's say to a similar molar site with only autologous bone, you can see by the, only by the coloration here, of course, you've got also the precise numbers. You see here, everything is red. That means, of course, you will have to wait for four or five months until you can load the implants, or you will need some bone condensation to improve the bone quality uh, in the native bone. And this is a new information that you, you were not able to receive before you started your therapy, your implant therapy, because you just do experience by the tort moment or but just by the feeling with your hands now before you start the therapy you can tell the patient your bones is not dense enough immediate loading is not impossible and your bone is in such a bad condition that instead of waiting only for three months we might have to wait for four months or five months and we cannot right away drill into the bone but we have to do some bone condensation measures this gives the patient a much higher trust in your um, in your competency as oral surgeon. Here you can see the results, but these I will skip because they were definitely correlated with the bone graft material. Here you see some depiction of the different bone materials we used. Highly greenish means very high bone density, and it was definitely correlated with the insertion torque value as the most reliable measurement for primary stability of implants. And here you can see the different bone graft materials. And the correlation between the Hounsfield values and the ITV values we measured during the implant insertion were significant. So that means, as a final conclusion, the um, CBCT bone densitometry is the first reliable instrument to determine the bone quality, the individual bone quality, of every single part of your patient's maxilla and mandibula to determine the bone quality for the proper implant planning. And this is now proven and it's general knowledge. So planning and execution of a seemingly difficult patient case. I don't want to leave you alone without, uh, let's say some, some typical cases. 
we know that in a lot of, uh, the more implants are placed all over the world, the more you will uh, see some implants fractured inside the bone. Whatever we discuss, this happens to all types of implants. It happens to noble biocare implants. It happens to cheaper uh, Taiwanese implants. It's a matter of fact because titanium is not unbreakable. And of course, you never should underestimate the forces the patient can exert on the implants. So this is just a short patient history. In May 2007, we inserted implants, primary stable. Then, of course, we had um, an implant loss because the patient was grinding. We didn't mention this. So we um, removed the implant. We inserted the two-stage implant with a four-month healing period. This is then after four months when the implant was healed. And now, where is my next slide? Okay. I'm sorry, because now it's somehow funny. Ah, here we go. And now in September 2009, the treatment was finished. So you see here, the implant was inserted. There is the crown. Meanwhile, we already had inserted a second two-stage implant, not to take chances. Then in October 2011, this was a checkup x-ray. In March 2014, you see every time only a two-dimensional panoramic x-ray. And in December 2017, at the 10 years implant anniversary, everything seemed to be fine. But in August 2018, bam, you see here the implant fractured. And now the question is, is it enough to do a CB, uh, is it enough to do a panoramic x-ray or would it be better to do a CBCT scan to get some idea why maybe this implant fractured? And of course we did this. You can see here now the result. Um, in the three-dimensional, there are several types to visualize this. Here you can see the fragment of the implant. You can see the superimposition of the implant, of the original implant, because you always have the possibility to download a database with your specific implant type and your implant system, and you can place them, you can superimpose them over existing implants, or you can place them virtually in your implant planning procedure. So in this case, you could see, this was the superimposed implant, we superimposed this implant onto the original implant. It was the same size and the same length to check, could it have been that the bone quality was not good enough? But as you can see here, the surrounding bone around this implant had a very, very high bone quality, an average higher bone quality than the average maxillary bone has. So of course, this was a typical failure of the implant. Maybe it was sized too small, but at that time it was the best option we had. And now you know it was a failure by the implant and not by the prosthetic treatment. So step by step going from the crystal to the apical part, you can check the bone density by absolute values and everything that is above around 500, 600 Huntsville units is already quite good bone quality, but the music starts to play as we see in Austria when we speak about 1000 Hounsfield. And you can see here, everything that is very highlighted green is very, very high bone density. So you can check this also in the longitudinal aspect of the bone at all different levels of the maxillary bone. And as you can see here, the bone quality is excellent. So what are we going to do now? The old fashioned protocol would have been bone devastating because you just had to remove the implant. I give you some of the examples how it was done before, grinding away the bone, destroying the bone, getting out the implant, then doing some funny bone augmentation procedures. And then after maybe one year, you were able to insert uh, the next implant. Of course, we don't do this anymore because the new gold standard in oral surgery is the piezotome surgery. And in this case, we call it the piezotome ridge preservation. Just to give you a short uh, overview, what tips we use here, it's the so-called ligament cutters. They are osteotomes that are used also for 
uh, atraumatic tooth removal. But in this case, of course, since the implant was also integrated or the fractured part was also integrated, we used it as osteotomes to remove the implant without bone loss. Here you can see the surgical site. Of course, meanwhile, after the fracture of the implant, since the site was not, not infected, uh, the soft tissue overgrew the site. So we did a minimal crest of lab. And as you can see here, this is the fractured part of the implant and the surrounding bone also by the looks, looks very nice. And we already know from the CBCT bone densitometry that the bone quality is very good. So what do we do? We use these osteotomes, these very, very fine osteotomes to cut the implant without losing the surrounding bone. Of course, this was a, um, a threaded implant. You will see the result then later on, but you're not destroying the bone and especially not this most valuable buccal bone lamella. Just imagine if you just use rotary instruments to remove this implant here, you would have to green the way this entire buccal bone lamella and do some bone augmentation. So the first time you could think of inserting a new implant would be after about let's say nine months up to one year. In this case, of course, the plan was not only to remove the implant, but simultaneously insert an, insert an implant with a wider diameter, also to cope with the possible fracture in the future. But to fulfill this task, the absolute must was not to remove any single gram of bone. So you just move around the implant with the different angulated tips, until the implant is completely liberated. And then you don't need all the time to go down to the apex of the implant because at a certain point, you will be able to start to unscrew the implant easily. You can see now this perfect prepared site. It's almost perfect to receive an implant directly. And actually this is what we did. And this is now where you can see how the implant was removed. And this is not only interesting as a case, but you can see now how it looks when an implant is fully also integrated. So what you can see here is a very, very dense bone and all these red structures here, these are the blood vessels. So you can see the bone around an implant is highly vascularized. But of course, since the implant was heavily threaded with a very aggressive threading for high primer stability, of course, unfortunately, we had to remove the bone because there is no way to get an angulated osteotomy. So if the threads of your implant are not as, um, as pronounced as in this implant system, then of course, the removal of bone within the threads will be less. But I want to point your attention to the precision. And of course, since the tips are made of a high quality material, of course, we tried to lose as little as possible bone. And this is why we also cut somehow the threads of the implant. So this is the situation how you remove an implant with burrs because you remove the bone and inside the bone is the implant. In this case, the removal was so precise and it was round, exactly the outer diameter of the threads of the implant. So it was possible without any further preparation with a drill, we just took an implant with a wider diameter, approximately, uh, it was about 0.5 millimeter wider than the original implant and inserted it directly primary stable. In this case, the insertion torque value was far beyond 50 Newton centimeters. It was around 56, 57 Newton centimeters. But of course, in this case, we didn't take chances with immediate loading. So this is then the situation when the scuffer screw was applied, the suture, and then of course, we did the post-surgical checkup with the x trium CBCT. Here you can see once again, the superimposition of the implant. Here you can see the two-dimensional representation derived from the CBCT. And you can see here the bone density, the average is 1,290 Hounsfield units. So this is, um, let's say, uh, extreme good bone quality for a maxillary bone. So here you can see the implant. 
the bone density dometry in the transversal aspect, you see highly green, and the highly green area is directly connected to the surface of the implant. You can see now the transversal view without uh, some few spaces where the bone density of the trabecular network of the maxilla was somehow poor with only about 800 Hounsville. All the rest is highly dense. This is then the superimposition of the implant and the future prosthetic planning. This is then the opening after three months. Since the bone quality was very good, we did the reopening after three months and the prosthetic treatment after three months. So this is how, let's say, planning and surgery should work out. This was the insertion. And of course, during the um, uh, screwing in of the abutment, it's vital to see if the abutment was not, let's say, doesn't show any gaps to the implant. So this is when, once again, the two-dimensional uh, chair side intraoral x-ray comes in just to check up because as you can see here, there is still a space in between the abutment and uh, the implant, although it felt solid. So you have it in your own hands also with this still two-dimensional representation of an ongoing treatment to check whether you're doing the right thing or not. So another case, the so-called borderline cases, how to avoid invasive surgery and complications by digital surgery planning and minimal invasive solutions. Um, I will just give you a very short look on a situation like this. Of course, you see the alveolar crest uh, is very narrow. But of course, with the panoramic X-ray, you cannot check what the width of the alveolar crest is. So before you start to think about implants, of course, you do the investigation. And the CBCT software, the AIS uh, 3D app version 5.0, gives you a step-by-step -step introduction and the step-by-step -step guidance, what you want to see, how you can manipulate uh, these images to focus on the issue that they're interested in. So in the first step, you can adjust the field of view because if you're only interested in this section, then of course you can cut away the rest. So if you turn around um, the surgical site in different aspects, then you are not occluded in your site by uh, counter site parts. You can then check the image quality, or you can check the bone situation with applying different filters. And every filter gives you a different aspect of the bone situation, of the situation of the roots, etc. And then, of course, you do a panoramic view because you want to know uh, exactly the outline of the sinus floor. This you can adjust either automatically or manually. I personally prefer to do it manually, but it's always up to you then to decide. And then, of course, once again, you do the reverse planning. That means the target for this patient is not to get the implants. The target for this patient is always the patient wants to have fixed prosthetics. And the fixed prosthetics, they have, be, have to be in the right place. So the software gives you the chance for a teeth setup. That means that once you fulfilled all these points in adjusting the site to your liking, then you can start to build the future prosthetic treatment. And this prosthetic treatment can be exported. It can be exported to a 3D printer or to your dental laboratory. And they can already start to construct, for instance, a provisional. So every tooth you can adjust by its size, by its position, by its torque, uh, by its length, and um, of course, it takes some time to get used to it. But once you're trained to do this, it's just a question of about five or 10 minutes until the final prosthetic treatment is finished. Then, of course, you can check if the occlusion is OK, how the cosmetic is, which is, of course, in this case, not that important because it's in the premolar area. Then, according to the implant system you need, you can see here, these are all the implant systems that are already in my database. But of course, if you have a very special system, then you just have to ask your implant provider to release the implant data 
to Action so that they can deliver it into the software. And then you can take this implant system you use and you can place the implant system. And you can see here that of course, since the alveolar crest width is very narrow, you will have to go for a widening procedure for, of the alveolar crest to insert the implants. And of course, you can also play around with the positioning of the implants. So what does this mean? First, we place the premolar, uh, the implant here. And then, of course, in case you want to avoid a sinus lift procedure, because with the sinus lift procedure, as you can see here in the lateral view, uh, there is only about three or four millimeter of alveolar crest left. That means you need a big sinus lift. This prolongs the treatment. So you can start to play around. Can I do some kind of um, compromise between an anatomical correct implant position and setting the implant to the most possible utmost, utmost point distal to avoid a sinus lift procedure. Because anyway, you have to do a widening of the alveolar crest. And in any case, if you can avoid to do two augmentation procedures, which will prolong the healing time, then of course you can do it in this way. And of course, spare costs for the patients. So in this case, we opted for avoiding the sinus lift procedure and just going for a crest split. That means that we have to do a compromise with the positioning of the implant. And this is also very important for the dental uh, technician to know beforehand because he already has to get the idea how he is going to set up then the final prosthetic treatment that is already done virtually and was exported to the dental technician so that he also knows from the very first beginning where the whole story is going to. So these are now the two implants in different views, three-dimensional view. Here you can see one again, once again, the bone density. But of course, now you will have to know what is the extent of bone augmentation you will have to do. So for this, we do also the surgical planning virtually. You can see here, this is the alveolar crest, which we have to augment. This is the superimposition of the implants. This is the superimposition of the uh, future uh, prosthetic treatment. And this tells you where do I need additional bone. You can export this and as a STL template and send this to your dental technician. But what you can do also is you can do the surgery already on the virtual CBCT image of the patient. You can do a superimposition. Once again, you re-import the STL file that you exported to the dental technician to view what is your need of augmentation and you can start to construct your crest splitting procedure. This is what we did in this case. So what we decided to do is instead of doing autologous bone block augmentation, we opted for the another surgical procedure with the piezotome that my research group developed. It's the so-called crest split procedure. And with this virtual planning, you exactly know the extent how far do you have to distract the alveolar crest to have a firm reception uh, base in the bone for the future implants? And of course, you know the angulation, not only for prosthetic treatment, but also for surgical treatment. Nowadays, it's highly important to know what should the surgical result be even before you start the surgery. And since you can see this in three dimensions, <clears throat> you will be able much easier to execute this site. Here you can see in the software, these are the exported STL files. This is the template for the surgery. And of course you can do always do the superimposition. <clears throat> but how do we proceed now in reality? You can see once again, we can see this in all three dimensions. And here you can see the surgical template. This is what we have to do when we do the crest split. Surgical execution. This is the crest split surgical procedure we developed in cooperation with Action. You see the very, very slim alveolar crest. It's between 1.2 and 2 millimeter wide. You just do a very, very small booklet flap on top of the alveolar crest 
not to detach the uh, periosteum from the bone? And why is um, especially piezotomes the new gold standard in the year 2020? Because uh, there is so much behind the piezotome, but unfortunately, since I'm limited in time uh, for today, I cannot give you all the details. But as a scientific base, and we published this back in 2017 in the International Journal of Oral and Craniofacial Science, a systematic review and meta-analysis of all publications between 2006 and 2016. And the take-home message or the stay-at-home message simply is piezotome surgery preserves and stimulates the full biological functionality of the endosteum and the periosteum by least traumat uh, traumaticity on bone and soft tissues. This is the first reason why it is so superior to rotary instruments. Then second, piezotome surgery initiates bone healing with the first cut by ultrasonic cavitational stimulation of soft and hard tissue healing. The answer is also very simple. And um, maybe I will have the chance once I come down to South Africa again, we will have a special piezotome surgical um, workshop where you can also work with the piezotome with your own hands on, on specimens. But what we know beyond any doubt is that if you apply the piezotome surgical instruments as your sole instrument for bone surgery, the osteoblast activity after one week, two weeks, and even after 54 days is four to three times higher than when you work on the same side with rotary instruments. And of course, the um, introduction of ultrasonic waves into hard and soft tissue initiates the vascular endothelia growth factor. So you have a much faster vascularization. And this is the secret why piezotome surgery is so superior to rotary instruments. And of course, as a practical outcome, piezotome surgery leads to more than 50% less patient morbidity. But unfortunately, this is a different story. So if you compare in this meta-analysis, uh, when you take the rotary instruments as the current standard or as the standard as it was 10 years ago, with the new gold standard, you see you have minimized terminal bone necrosis with piezotome, smooth osteotomy surface only with piezotome, bacterial contamination prevention, and not only bacterial, it's also valid for COVID infections. You have an improved bone healing. Just compare, if you do um, surgery with rotary instruments with burrs, just watch your face shield, how splattered it is with blood and with liquid. Once you start to work with the piezotome, you will see there is no single drop on your face shield. Instead, only if the patient cuffs at you during the surgery. Improved bone healing, proven for piezotomes, high precision bone cut design. Now you can really design your bone grafts, your autologous bone blocks, and you can design your osteotomies, which is not possible with the rotary instruments. You have a precise depth control, you have an almost lossless bone cut. With some of the tips we developed, you have do have an absolute less loss, lossless bone cut. The prevention of soft tissue injuries with a burr on the nerve, it's gone. With a tip on the mandibular nerve, when it's just touching the nerve and you don't stay with force on the nerve, in no way to harm the mandibular nerve. This is why I do impact the third molars. Um, nowadays only with piezotone. And of course, significant reduction of post-surgical patient morbidity. But as I told you before, this is just another story. This is just the references um, of all the things I told you now, but you can look this up then later on. Let's get back to this case. So how did we execute this case? This is again, the surgical site. So we just reveal with a small booklet flap, and this is very important, we don't prepare a mucoperiosteal flap, so that means the distracted bone plate is going to stay vital. Then we do the initial crest splitting, mesiodistal. You can see here, this is the initial osteotomy. Then we do the buccal relief osteotomies. They are very important because if you don't do them, then of course there might be an accidental fracture here. And then step by step, and this is also included into the 
up heat storm kit for crest splitting, you can exactly and precisely measure the widening of the side. And since we calculated this already before, and you will see now the superimposition, now the implants are inserted. And this is the original situation. This is the original situation as a superimposition of the CBCT scan. This is the bone filter superimposition. This is the X-ray filter imposition. Here again, from a different angle of view, bone filter superimposition, uh, another bone filter superimposition. This is where you have planned to do your osteotomy line, also in the superimposition. This is then the view after the initial um, osteotomy. This is then after widening. And this is now where the template, the surgical template comes in. Of course, you can do this also with your aneral camera. If you have an assistant that can handle the computer in the background, you can even check with the superimposition template if your uh, final result with implants inserted is correct. And of course, you can check, wait, I will go back here and show this again. And of course, you can check here if the implants are inserted in the right spot. You can see here the cover screws of the implant. You can see here the virtual implants in the template. And you can already see the prosthetic treatment that will be then finalized after the healing period. So the remaining gap is filled with bone graft material. And then, of course, you don't have to worry if there is a small space open, this will heal by secondary intention. And now you can do the check. This is the situation before and after. So this is the follow-up. This is then the template with the superimposition. And you can see, wait, I will go once again back. You can see the implants with the superimposition are exactly in the right spot. This is because you did the planning before virtually. It gives you a much higher safety. This is once again the superimposition. These are the virtual implants superimposed with the inserted implants. You see, there are only very, very small deviations. And uh, you might remember the last, um, the last Congress in February in, in um, where was it? It was in... Well, anyway, um, we have some slight discrepancies uh, between when we start to construct uh, surgical guides. It's not always precise on the one tenth of a millimeter, but this is precise on, let's say, 0 0.5 millimeters. Okay, here you can see another projection of the two implants. Here you can see the implants in the row. You see we exactly met the spot to avoid a sinus lift, yeah? And this is the mesial implant. This is the distractal buccal bone plate, which is very important. Once again, the superimpositions, once again, the superimposition of the surgical template. Here now, the virtual insertion of the implant, and you can see the buccal bone lamella and the palatal bone lamella, high bone density. But since this was done immediately after the um, after the surgery, of course, in the adjacent um, areas, of course, the bone is not dense because it still has to heal. But what is so important is that we know that the bone density on the outside of the implant, on the surface of the implant in contact with the bone is reliable. And here you can see this is almost a 100 match. This is the superimposition of the template with the real implant inside. Here we've got a slight deviation, but since this is highly magnified, it's about 0.5 millimeter, which is quite satisfactory. Once again, the superimposition of the surgical template, just to see that we exactly met the planned outcome. Okay, so this is then the final result in different bone filters. Once again, you can play around this to visualize the threads of the implant bone density, et cetera, et cetera. So, Unfortunately, I'm already a little bit over time, but I give you just a very, very last uh, view on a case with an intralift where we did a tooth extraction because you can see here with this periodontal disease, there is no way to keep this tooth. But 
with the intralift, you're able to extract the tooth and then do the intralift simultaneously. Once again, we want to check the periodontal situation and the bone situation in the three-dimensional x-ray. And once you see the periodontal defect and the bone defect on the base of the apex of this tooth, then you know there is no way, even with the best uh, periodontal surgical therapy, to save this tooth. So of course we have to do an extraction. So in this case, we extracted the tooth and precisely on the spot, which we already calculated before we even extracted the tooth where the bone was very thin, we did the intralift. And the nice thing with intralift is it's always precisely on the spot where you want to do it. And it's always going to the palatal side and to the buccal side, exactly where you want to place your implant later on. This is the view on the other side of the patient where she already received the intralift and the implants some eight or nine years ago. But of course, we simultaneously did an augmentation of the alveolar crest. This is then the situation after the surgery. And <clears throat> you can play around once again with the software because this is where the, um, let's say the field of view cutting tool comes into the game because I don't want to see the uh, trigomotor alveolar crest here. I just want to see the volume and the outline of the sinus lift. So you just virtually cut away the zygoma here and take a look inside. How does your sinus lift configuration look like? And this is so beautiful because it gives you the safety to know that your sinus lift was fully controlled and fully satisfactory and successful. Of course, there was no way to do a simultaneous implant insertion. So we went then for a secondary stage implant planning after about six months. You can see here, once again, we insert the implants virtually and we do the bone densitometry and, oops, let me check. Okay, and this is, our research team, this is Professor Marcel Wainwright, that's Andreas Kurek, and that's me. And this is our research group. So unfortunately, I have to admit that something happened with my presentation here because uh, unfortunately, I wanted to show you also the result, but somehow these slides were skipped. But let me finish then now with this case. And um, I will add then the final results because I'm already a little bit over time. So no way to look it up now and to add them. But just trust me, this is how nowadays you should do a planning, how the digital workflow should be. Don't leave chances to your therapy. Always try to know before you start the therapy, what will be every single step in your therapy. And this you can do with modern digital imaging, three-dimensional representation and three-dimensional workflow and export and communication with your dental technician. And if you're interested in a wider view of both piezotone lectures and CBCT training courses, I invite you to copy or make a screenshot of my last slide. This is the homepage of our organization. The homepage will be refurbished by 4th of December, so you will have then direct access on our homepage to our videos. Meanwhile, you just click on this and then you click on the video section, video education section and lecture education section. You will be redirected to the, our YouTube channel and to our OneDrive where you can download all this lecture, also this lecture. And so I'm sorry that I extended my speech time for about 10 minutes. I thank you very much for listening to me. And now I will be glad to receive your questions. So Marius, ah. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Gunban, okay. <laughs> I'd like to get Marius and Julian back as part to, to our panel as well. Marius is um, already here. Marius, yeah, is Julian back? I'm here. 
I can okay. connect Thanks with you. That. Hello. Yeah. Welcome right. back. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Your presentation has been indeed an interesting presentation with lots of important information for us. Um, looking if there's any questions and answers, I don't see if there's any question. I don't see any questions currently. We'll keep the panel open for a little bit. If there's any further questions, if whoever has them can post them on the Q&A team and I'll gladly ask them to Prof. Prof, from my side, a quick question. What's your opinion with regards to the use of CBCTs and looking at fractures in teeth? <clears throat> let's, let's put it way, uh, that way. If you take a small field, field of view, and if you really have a, the highest possible resolution, and this is, as far as I know, only possible with the X-Mantrium right now, because the finest resolution is 0.75 micrometers, then if there is already a slight gap in the dentin or in the animal, you will be able to see it provided the patient really sits very, very still. The problem in CBCT scanning is uh, the new CBCT devices are pretty fast, but the smallest shutter of the head of the patient, even and especially at the finest possible resolution, might lead that the possible fracture of the, of the animal or of the dentin might be obscured. So we did a small series of checkups where we let's say from the clinical situation, since we were able to look inside the cavity before we, did, we started the endodontic treatment, or if there was a fracture of the crown, it, we were able to see that there is a fracture. We sent the patient uh, to do a highest possible resolution, small field of view um, x-ray. And in about 50% of the patients, it was possible to see the fracture clearly. It's more easy with the animal the problem with the animal, on the other hand, is if there is already a filling, then the, let's say, the, the uh, disburging beams, the artifacts, they will occlude the site on the animal fracture. So once you have a, um, a filling, even if it's a, some kind radiolucent filling, then the chance to detect the fracture in the animal will be very, very small, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Prof. Then we have a question from one of our an anonymous attendees. The question is, can you do the split crest surgery on the mandible to place implants? Oh, yes, oh, yes, yeah. definitely. Actually, the main reason why we developed the breast split technology uh, with the bone lossless bone cut was the narrow alveolar crest in the mandible because mostly you will find patients that lost their first, their uh, second premolar in the mandible, then the first molar, then the premolars, and the rest from K9 to K9 was, is, is okay. The problem is that the patients then will wear a partial overdenture for quite a long time. And as we know, in the first approximately six to 12 weeks, we already lose about 25 to 40% of bone width and then if this time is protruded, and if there is the load of the partial overdenture, you end up with, let's say, sometimes only one millimeter alveolar crest width. And it's always, let's say, the relation between the alveolar crest height and the width. The width is narrowing very, very fast. The height stays quite long. So provided you have at least 10 millimeter or 11 millimeter of alveolar crest height, above the mandibular nerve, then it is when the crest split comes in. And to extend the possibility to do crest splits to very, very narrow alveolar crests of, a pro of only one millimeter, we developed this, um, this uh, tip set because with these tips, you are able to cut bone lossless and you can perform the entire procedure without raising a full thickness mucoperostal flap. So um, if this participant, you're welcome, uh, visits our homepage and visits our video channel, he can see at least three or four cases from the diagnosis to the therapy planning to the surgical e execution, where we did this with a very, very narrow mandibular alveolar crest. The crest splitting in the maxilla is much easier 
because the bone is more soft, the bone is more elastic. So in the maxilla with these uh, crest splitter tips, the whole procedure might take about 10 minutes at all, plus implant insertion, plus stuffing some bone graft material. In the mandible, it's going to take about 10 to 15 minutes because the buccal relief osteotomy at the beginning and at the end of the mesiodistal osteotomy is somehow time consuming. But for this, you have to take some patience because you just have to imagine what would be the alternative. The alternative would be the Curie technique or autologous bone block transfer. What does this mean? You have to open a second site, and especially if it's in the lateral mandible, of course, you can harvest the bone only from the chin. With the long term result, the patient will, for the rest of the life, maybe have some paresthesias here on the chin, or if you do the initial cut a little bit too high up, that you do an episectomy and you devitalize the uh, lower front teeth, or you can have the lateral mandible on the contrary side. So this procedure, especially when done with rotary instruments, takes at least 15 to 20 minutes. Then you have to prepare, prepare the receptacle side, you have to screw, uh, the bone block, you cannot insert the implant simultaneously. So the whole project is going to take about six months minimum, some, in most of the cases about nine months to one year. And it's not 100% safe because it happens a lot of times that you then want to insert the implant, you do the primary drill hole for the implant, you insert the implant and suddenly the bone block pops off again because it's that bone, it, it has no magic. It's just a dead bone block. It's, it can also be a synthetic bone block. It will also integrate. And while it is also integrating, it's also losing volume. So instead you do a more biological approach because what you do with the crest split is simply, you cut the vital bone, which is very narrow in two even more narrow vital bone parts. The buccal bone is still attached to the periosteum. That means it's living bone. The lingual part is living bone. So from the biological side, from the view of the bone, it's some kind of bigger extraction site. So it will heal spontaneously, but to keep the widening open, you insert most of the times the implant immediately because it's the a door stopper to keep the widening open. And in between, you just place some bone graft material or autologous bone or whatever you, uh, you decide to insert. You close, and mostly after three to four months, you can load the implants. The risk is about 90% lower. We published this and this I will present. Well, anyway, this is presented also on our video learning channel. We published this uh, this year in the Journal of Oral and Cranial Maxillofacial Surgery, where we did a, a randomized clinical trial comparing autologous bone block um, augmentation with the uh, crest splitting in the upper jaw and in the lower jaw. So if anyone is interested, he can send me an email and I can send uh, the full text publication with all the photos because um, only if you have a membership to the Journal of Oral and Cranial Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, you will be able to read the full text. So just send me a, an email and I will send you the full text. Okay, thanks, Prof. Then we have one more question. Yes. The question is from the same person that asked the previous question. Are these items referred to in the talk available in South Africa? Oh, this, unfortunately, I cannot answer. Um, um, Maybe we could ask Marius to help you. Yeah, I think he has yes. to tell you. Yes, yes, yes. So all the items and all the equipment that was talked about in the lecture, uh, from the cube to the CBCT, are available from Indra Science South Africa. Okay, perfect. Um, I don't see that there, I see that there's no further questions. So with that, I'd like to say thank you, Prof, for your interesting presentation. Once again, thank you, thank you very much. to Dental Warehouse and to Eltion for the sponsorship for tonight. With regards to some final announcements for the evening, um, please no, take note of the upcoming events. Our next upcoming event is from the 30th of November to the 3rd of December, which will be the Stronger Together Congress program with four evenings of international speakers and lucky draws to the value of 30,000. So keep, your, keep a watch on your emails for those 
invites. A reminder again to all the delegates to complete this the survey at the end of the session. With that, I'd like to declare tonight's evening, uh, tonight's session closed. And with thank you to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And many greetings down to South Africa. And I really hope that next year we will be back in person. How, how about you, Julian? I'm, I'm, I'm hope that this situation will be cleared up quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll have good, good uh, time to, to, go, to go to South Africa. It was a real pleasure last time. Because so I still remember that we, we come again. I yeah. still remember the supermarket when we get the big <laughs> Red Bull bottles. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.